Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE. Covering Red Hat Summit 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat. Okay, welcome back everyone. Live here in San Francisco, California at Moscone West is theCUBE's exclusive coverage of Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier, your co-host with my co-host analyst, John Troyer, co-founder of Tech Reckoning and uh, it's an analyst firm and community development advisory. Our next guest is Stormy Peters, Senior Manager, Community Leads at Red Hat. Welcome to theCUBE. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you too. Thanks for having me. So obviously the success of open source is grounded in community. We love talking about community. And there's a lot of new things happening, new dynamics that are somewhat similar to what's in the past, but a new generation is coming into open source. It's clear by the growth. I mean, go to any, any event, you know, just at the Linux Foundation event, Jim Zellin's always at the slide up. Exponential growth, more code coming in. So, you know, we have to trot out all the ethos contribute, be part of a project, and so the, the, the lines are still there, but it's evolving. And what's your thoughts on, on it as it grows? I'm looking at the big ecosystem here, growing at Red Hat, more contributors, more projects, more products. Yeah, we definitely have, com the communities are growing and we have more participation in all the projects across the board. And I think one of the things that, that's interesting is the, the projects that we're working on are things that one person can't develop or use all on their own. And um, we're talking like software-defined storage, we're talking OpenStack, big solutions. And so companies are, are paying people to work on them. And I think over the last 10 years, that's been the really big difference. I had a conversation with Dirk at VM who was heading up all their open source and we were just in, in Copenhagen. And, and he was reiterating, and reminding me because I found myself falling into the trap. And a lot of new companies that come into open source, hey, I'm going I'm to get people involved in a, in a product. I'm going to join that project so we can commercialize the project. Versus commercialize their offering and being part of a project. So Dirk and I were talking and he was emphasizing language is everything. Language defines behavior. And that the project is an open contributed project. People work on it. <laughs> and the product that's commercialized is different. And this is not new to Red Hat, but it's worth just reamplifying some of the language as new people come in. Your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, so at Red Hat, we're really clear on what's upstream, um, what's the open source version that everyone's working on together, and then what's the version that we're supporting for our customers. And they have the same code base, they have the same features, um, but the upstream version we call a project, and the downstream version we call a product and sometimes they're even branded differently. For example, Manage IQ is the upstream project, and Cloudforms, Red Hat Cloudforms, is the downstream product. And that's where the action is for Red Hat to, to commercialize and, or productize. Support, productize, Support and yeah. get all around it, but then they contribute everything back upstream. Yeah, everything's developed upstream. So you and, you and uh, the other community uh, managers, uh, are you at, at Red Hat, it's a little bit different, right? Open source, the open source way, an open source ethos. Uh, so you do have uh, you know, these open source communities as well as user communities. Are you involved with both? I mean, how do you, how do you meld the two? How do you differentiate the two you know, in the context of Red Hat, if I'm a Red Hat customer? Yeah, so, so they're all the same or overlapping. So usually you'll have a, a core group of contributors um, who maybe, some may be Red Hat employees, some may work at another company that's either a user company or a partner company, some may be individuals working on it, and that's kind of your core base, but then you have like people that, that are participating, watching very carefully, maybe contributing once in a while that are watching that, and then you have users. And, and so they're not separate groups of people, they're overlapping groups of people. That's great. The, um, in terms of community here at the show, right? Uh, once you have community that's that's uh, 365, right? You come you come to an event and it's like kind of like homecoming. So how has the experience been this year for you at Red Hat Summit with the Red Hat community, people coming together, um, you know, act, community activities, that sort of thing? It's it's a really great place to bring people together. So the we have all of our customers, we have contributors, and everyone is on the floor talking. So. Like we, we're in Community Central um, here in the, the floor, and our booth has been full of people all day long. Even when they announce that it's closing, there's still people around and talking. And we have everything from customer events, where we talk to customers about how we work on Upstream, um, to actually the, we've had contributor meetups where everyone gets together and, and meets all their fellow contributors in person. How do you guys handle the growth? Because you know, with, with growth you have still new ideas coming in. So you want to keep an open, inclusive environment. Is there any new things you guys are doing to make sure all the best ideas are being surfaced up or is it uh, the same uh, program seems to keep going the, that way? 
So I think, I think the best projects evolve over time. So we're always looking at the governance of a project and does it fit where that project is right now. Um, so when a project first starts out, it might have a benevolent dictator, and then later when it has more contributors and more companies involved, you might, have, you might evolve to a, a board or to a technical group. Um, so for example, Gluster, we just graduated to a group of um, maintainers that make decisions as opposed to just a project lead. Is there a, like a norm or is there a certain pattern that emerges for the, the, the programs, I mean the projects? Um, having certain format that you've seen that works best? Or I, is it more ad hoc based on who's involved? It's a little ad hoc, but I think most of them start with a very strong personality who has a vision, and so a lot of them start either as benevolent dictators or as you know, someone who's the main project lead, and then as they grow bigger over time, you end up with more of a, a voting membership, board of directors style, so like Apache. And then now today, there's a lot of foundations involved too, right? Some some things uh, are 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 in the Red Hat orbit more more closely. Other we you know like uh, we were just at KubeCon, so the all the Linux Foundation, different the mm -hmm. for instance the Kubernetes, uh, the CNCF, CNCF, as well as yep. stuff like you know the Cloud Foundry and OpenStack Foundation. So I mean, can you talk a little bit about the role of foundations now in modern uh, community and social open source? Yeah, I think it's, it's part of this evolution from all the contributors were working as individuals, which they still are, to companies being able to, to pay for people to work on these projects. And so the companies want to not just give people time to these projects, they also want to donate um, money and pool their resources to do joint marketing or to push Kubernetes forward. And so organizations like the CNCF, the Linux Foundation, enable those companies um, to work together more effectively. CNCF's done a good job of balancing, I mean, they got a lot of logos, I mean, yeah. a lot of people paying them money, so there's a commercial aspect. But they've been very uh, transparent about, they're trying to create a great core community and they've separated the technical steering committee from mm -hmm. the membership, which is smart. Most of the foundations are really good about leaving the technical steering committee to work as it's worked well in open source and then having the companies pool their money for, for marketing or, or for filling in the holes where they're not getting volunteers. Sure. And I, go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, well, Stormy, I just wanted to extend the, the governance conversation a little mm -hmm. bit to, uh, to culture as well. Um, the, I mean, we're, we're in an interesting place, again, 2018 in our bigger culture. Uh, those of us who've been involved in online culture and online communities, we know the ways these things can go wrong. Um, and we've seen it. You know, how, how do you uh, as an individual and, and your team uh, develop and, and foster a, a inclusive and a participatory culture in, your, in the communities of Red Hat? I, I think you said we've all seen things go wrong, but I think we also have a lot of experience now about how to foster the culture that we would like and how to include people. And um, so you're seeing a lot more efforts. Like most online communities are, are pretty nice places to hang out these days. And you're seeing a lot of effort to make sure there's code of conduct for the projects, that there's code of conduct for the events, um, that people are welcome, there's a diversity event tomorrow here. Um, so I think we're seeing a lot more inclusiveness and a real effort to, to bring people in. You guys attract a younger demographic. We were talking earlier um, with Denise, mm -hmm. uh, and because of it's open source, you got academic. You uh -huh. know, it can go as high school. You're seeing everything from robotics clubs to you know coding early on. So you get you, Red Hat's getting them early, <laughs> and so she made a comment. We're going to grow our own talent. So you know, kind of tongue in cheek, but you guys have access to a lot of the younger developers. Uh, any commentary on? You know, the orientation, obviously they love mission-driven, uh, the younger folks love mission-driven and tech, but is there any kind of uh, new school kind of concepts you're seeing coming from the young guns that are coming up through the ranks? So I, I recently had a chance to speak to a classroom full of college students and I was really impressed. Like, they, they knew what open source was, they were familiar with licenses, and they all wanted to like make their app or make money, but they were really focused on humanitarian causes at the same time. And so I was really impressed with that. I want to do well in my career, but I want to make a difference in the world in a better place. And that, that was really exciting to see. And now, more than ever, with a global footprint, we just had UNICEF on earlier here, Red Hat Labs, doing some pretty cool things around, you know, code for good. So I think that's cool. The challenge we're seeing is, is that, okay, as enterprises come in, the continued balance, it's always been the case. They don't want the big one vendor coming in for on their weight around. Uh, and we're seeing, like, even with Java, you know, which is Oracle, Java E, mine's Oracle, seeing movement, that's kind of opening up. So it, it seems the business model seems to be 
pretty clear, open's winning. We certainly think so at Red Hat. Like <laughs> the, the best model is to be open. <laughs> What's it like to work here? It's a really awesome place to work. I, I love all the people that I work with. That's, you know, everyone, Red Hat really takes the open source culture not just to its code base, but also to the culture that it has within the organization. And decisions are, are made openly, discussed openly. Everyone gets input. Everyone doesn't always get to vote, but everyone gets to, to have a say and is listened to. And it's, it's a great place to work. Technical culture as well, obviously techies. Yes, very technical too. Yeah. As, the, as the ecosystem grows, right, the, there's obviously a lot more participants in the community. And so um, if a company uh, wants to get involved either say like in the Kubernetes community or in the OpenShift community, you know, what's the right way for a company to come in and participate in that kind of a community? Uh, and, um, and, and maybe what, what are some wrong ways? Uh, if, if a company wants to get involved in the community, I think the first thing they do is find them online, right? Are they on IRC talking? Are they on Slack talking? Join the mailing list. Um, go to whatever events are local to you, your local meetups. Go to the big events if you can. Um, and just put people on it. People that, that know what you're trying to do with it and, and can contribute you know, either with getting started documentation or with bug reports. Um, yeah, I think it does have to come down to the people. You have to send yeah. actual people in. It can't yes. be some sort of corporate motion. And uh, uh, in some ways, community is all about people and making connections. It's absolutely about people. So talk about your experience this year, Red Hat. So obviously the numbers are bigger. They're getting great, uh, the company's getting great reviews from financial analysts. Uh, OpenShift has been very popular. Some of the, the obviously the systems with Kubernetes have been phenomenal. O OpenStack's got a bunch of life into it. You're seeing separation. Clear visibility now on how things are kind of clicking together on the app side. Core OS is in. Uh, it's just interesting, right? This is Red Hat's kind of going to a whole nother level. What's the conversations like here inside the hall? People who aren't here watching, uh, didn't have a chance to come. What, what's, what's the main conversations, the chatter? What's been the focus? So in the Community Central booth, I think the focus has been on how things work together, like how our different products work together and how you can use them together, um, as well as like, how do I follow along? Like, how do I participate? If I want to know where RDO is going, where, where do I go to, to be part of it? What's the coolest thing you've heard here at the show that you could share, story? Oh, the coolest thing I've heard. I don't know if I have a, a moment, but it's, it's just been all the conversations and like the fact that there's people flowing through all the time. It's like standing room only in the booth because people want to talk. There's a lot of action. Yeah. A lot of face-to-face -face engagement. Yeah. All right. Oh, I, I do have a story. So we had, um, we taught these, uh, these Red Hat went to Boston and taught these middle school girls how to make cameras out of open hardware and open source software. Has anyone talked to you about this? No. Um, and so they made these cameras and then we flew a couple of them out here and they taught a group of people here at the event on Monday how to make, so these 11 year olds, 12 year olds taught them how to make cameras out of open hardware and open source software. And I was at, talking to one of them about what was different about teaching it. it that, that was probably my favorite moment. It's hard to be a teacher when, yeah, you got you to know the material. Yeah. But that's paying it forward. That's the open source ethos. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. So anyway, thanks for coming on theCUBE and sharing. Great to see you again. Congratulations on all the success. And again, the community's buzzing. You guys are doing great and uh, exciting. So thanks for coming on, sharing. Appreciate it. Thanks so, for having me. Live CUBE coverage here in San Francisco for Red Hat Summit 2018. I'm John Furrier. John Furrier, stay with us. Day two coverage continues for three days of coverage after the short break. Be right back. Oh.